why are we even having this debate, actually? Let's ask that fundamental question. And the reason is really simple. It's because we're a small island with a large population. In fact, I mean, England, particularly, is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. 383 people per square kilometre. That feels quite tight, doesn't it? That's why we're having the problem. But this isn't a new problem. I mean, since time immemorial, we've faced competition for land, and particularly intensely since the Industrial Revolution. And yes, there are inequalities, both geographic, social, economic, to do with access to infrastructure, access to services, and indeed the way that we want to live our lives. But all civilised societies have tried to address this issue to a greater or lesser extent. And you can actually go back to the Romans. They were big infrastructure builders, weren't they? Those great roads across our countryside, those wonderful aqueducts and great structures, which now are incredibly beautiful, and we all rush to protect them. And the Victorians, absolutely right. That was when the arguments really started. And I do remember reading Middlemarch, actually, as a teenager, and that was all about the railway, wasn't it? And actually, I wasn't going to quote Ruskin, but I was going to quote Wordsworth, um, who famously stood up against the uh, Lake District into the heart of the, it, the railway into the heart of the Lake District, whereas, actually, ironically, as you know perfectly well, Jim, he'd written this guide to the lakes, and it was his fault that everyone wanted to come and see them, but it uh, was ever thus, I guess. But actually, it wasn't until the 20th century that we really uh, had to get a grip on this and realise that um, there had to be a better way than isolated projects storming through the countryside, creating uh, anxiety. And actually, if you look back, I think it was that 1945, that post-war government that really tried to join things up. And I think, actually, looking back, we talk about joined-up government all the time, don't we now? I don't think we've succeeded, by the way, in joined-up government. But they really tried in 1945. If you think about it, that great raft of legislation establishing the NHS, establishing uh, that right to um, education for all, our planning system, Abercrombie's plan for London, new towns, the national grid. It was the first time really tried to think holistically and strategically right across the piece. And in fact, famously, with the planning legislation, actually nationalised development rights. Well, that didn't last long, did it? Um, Nationalisation was quickly very unacceptable politically, um, and that sense of market forces were the way to do these things. And people genuinely found that idea of joined-up government uh, very hard to deliver. But I think those are some of the reasons why we're facing the kind of problems today that, in a way, Jim, you were describing because we do have an ageing infrastructure. We have seen you know, successive attempts, not very clever attempts, to get major projects through. I mean, no one is denying that. But actually, what I think we have got is the wrong answer. Because what everyone seems to say, that the problem is actually that we need to get through projects faster. We need to stop people's right to object. And that, to me, is the fatal flaw. Because I think... That means we're in the wrong paradigm. And I mean, I would even ask the question, do we need a national infrastructure for everything? Isn't that the question we should be asking? And I think that may be why sustainability is proving such a big challenge for society, because we've become completely obsessed with big projects as the way we do everything. Power stations have to be enormous. Actually, massive secondary schools, and you may have seen there's a huge debate in the press at the moment about everyone wanting smaller schools, more local schools. Hospitals, hospital provision is driven by the need for specialisms to treat acute illnesses, which creates a need for critical mass and everything brought together in huge, great hospitals, rather than a focus on local services and preventative health. The loss of cottage hospitals around the country means you have to drive... 40 miles to give birth, which is not um, actually a very technically complicated thing to do most of the time. Um, and there are examples from other countries who have tackled these issues and tried to do things differently. And just let me give an example from Germany, who've gone local in terms of energy supply. They've gone from 6.3% of renewables in 2000 to 16% today, and they're heading for 30. Now, some of that, I will absolutely um, agree, is big renewables. But actually, an enormous amount of it is household-scale renewables. And the way they've done that is that they've given an incentive to people 
through feed-in tariffs, that if you generate, if your house becomes a little power station, you generate surplus electricity from renewable sources, they've guaranteed that you can sell that into the grid for 20 years at a fixed price. I mean, that's a huge incentive. The government has required that every single new-built house has built-in renewable energy systems. And there's a £350 million euro grant scheme to homeowners to install micro-renewables in their houses, whether that's solar systems or wood burners or heat pumps or whatever. That has transformed the picture in Germany. And it means that they're going to get their particular political imperative, of course, was to get off nuclear. And they will get off nuclear by uh, 2030. So can we envisage other examples of that kind of behaviour, that kind of approach, where you're no longer talking about just how many power stations we've simply got to have, but actually turn the telescope round, look at it from the other way up. And people are talking about exactly that. This little booklet came through my um, letterbox the other day from Nesta called Mass Localism. And this is exactly on the same point. It's saying if you have community-based schemes that are good enough and that are engaging enough, you can actually build a critical mass from very localised solutions, very sensitive to local needs, and actually give local ownership to the community so that they can actually adapt to their own circumstances and have far more sensitive and far more um, connected and actually uh, trusted uh, solutions in their own local area. Now, I'm not denying that we need some national infrastructure projects. I would be mad to do that. Of course there are. And rail, of course, is one of those things you can't just leave to local communities. I completely accept that. But I utterly defend people's right, not only to challenge, but to be involved, to suggest alternatives, to get stuck in. Because that is a fundamental democratic opportunity and right. And I think if there were fewer national infrastructure streams, if we didn't feel we were just being assailed by you know, these big projects, I would guess that we'd all, including the proponents, be more committed to getting them right. And it wouldn't be, oh, how quickly can we get them through? How can we stop these wretched objectors? It would be all about Let's do this really well. And actually, I do remember those Channel Tunnel Rail Link days very, very well, because I was in CPRE, and there were objections to it. But I also remember Sandy Bruce Lockhart, the late lamented Sandy, saying, I want a rail link through Kent. It will be good for the economy. It will be good for Kent. I will get it right. And goodness, you know, pouring over maps, community meetings all around the county, never stopped talking to people, never stopped involving people. It absolutely was a grassroots, sort of bottom-up way of trying to find the best route. And actually, it's not bad. But it didn't come from a top-down process. It came from real engagement and real understanding. But I also remember some horrible moments at my time at CPR. I remember the A14 being put in as effectively a new motorway right across the country. And do you know what? That decision was based on the idea that it would save three minutes of lorry time as against the alternative. I remember thinking, three minutes isn't long enough to stop and have a pee, actually. What are we doing? I mean, it really felt so top-down, so wrong, and actually... You know, this idea, this mass localism, this idea of building capability from within is a much more sustainable route. So my question tonight is, can we turn the telescope round? Can we give power to local people to find their own solutions, to articulate the contribution they can make? And of course, the government's input is essential, but it's different. It is not, as we've just seen in relation to the Infrastructure Planning Commission, a great new list of power stations that obviously have got to be built. It's not that answer. Instead, it's a coherent national policy framework guided by sustainability principles which set a level playing field, as the German government has done, you know, incentivizing more sustainable solutions within which then local communities can find solutions to a very large number, not all, but a very large number of the problems that we supposedly need big infrastructure projects to solve. And I think we might be surprised by just how clever we can be. Energy is a really good example where we have got obsessed with big projects. For example, the National Trust, and I'm not going to bang on about the National Trust, but we've just made a commitment to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel by 50% by 2020, which is faster than any government target, all by micro-renewables, all with a complete win-win on aesthetic, 
on wider environmental and on cultural heritage grounds. It can be done. Now, of course, there are different needs for cities and urban areas as opposed to rural areas. There are different challenges. But I think we should trust our society to take responsibility for the different solutions and the different opportunities that arise. It is not any longer appropriate to say one size fits all. The same mechanism will solve every problem. Of course, we must define where we really need national infrastructure and plan this really well, but without excluding those people whose lives would be affected, and I do in this case say the Chilterns, where we're all going to be very anxious about the precise route, not the principle, but the route it follows. And why not let's go up the M1 corridor and across instead of through the Chilterns? You know, those sort of solutions could work. But let's engage local people. Let's rely on local resources. Let's talk about resilience and the way in which society can plan its own future, moving towards a more sustainable, low-carbon economy, harnessing people's desire to be part of planning our future collectively. I think there's a very exciting way forward there. Thank you.